chest. Ooh. Good morning and welcome to the Bay Area UFO Expo. I'm your host, Robert Perella. How y'all doing? This is year number 12. Can you believe it? Wow, we're growing old together. I was just telling a friend down here in the audience that I thought if, if my life was going to go by this fast, I think I'd want my money back. Uh, what a remarkable time to be alive. What a remarkable time of great changes. Um, UFOs, angels, extraterrestrials, the paranormal, the supernatural, the unbelievable, and even the simply fantastic is upon you. We're reaching into the year 2012. We're going into new modalities of thought, consciousness, and awareness. It's a really amazing time to be alive, for sure. The Bay Area UFO Expo is in its 12th year. We've been hosting uh, UFO researchers, ufologists, authors, um, metaphysicians, uh, what have you. And we have a wonderful, wonderful uh, weekend lined up of all kinds of people that you see on your program guide from uh, George Osuklas and Nancy Talbot, Tricia McCannon, Nick Pope, and of course our next speaker and first speaker of the weekend, who I think is really special because I don't know about you guys, they say, well, you watch too much TV, Robert. Well, maybe I do because I watch Ancient Aliens. How many people watch, uh, have seen Ancient Aliens on the History Channel? Wow, I just saw this the other night and I was watching Jason and thinking, wow, this is a guy who really knows what's going on with ancient aliens, uh, metaphysical history, ancients, and sacred sites. So I think you're going to find this a very wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, Jason here has been on quite a bit of things. He's been on the Discovery Channel, the History Channel, Sci-Fi Channel, and the BBC in Great Britain for all of you, and today his lecture is called The Extraterrestrial Connection. All ancient cultures speak of time when they had a connection with beings from n not only Earth that were both spiritually and technologically and more advanced than us, but they have also had contact with many other planets, but mostly us. Brace for impact. This is our good friend, Jason Martell. Good morning, everyone. All right, well, I get to give everyone the, the caffeine first uh, lecture this morning. It's awesome. And uh, let's see, you're going to have to bear with me because I do not see anything on my monitor, but we do see these nice large screens. So from time to time, I might have to kind of look over and see what we're both looking at. OK, so today I'm going to be talking about ancient technology. Um, my research has culminated in 15 years um, on the coattails of Zachariah Sitchin, Eric Von Daniken looking at some of these primitive cultures and seeing their advanced technology, advanced sciences, and starting to scratch my head and wonder, how did they learn all of this? Uh, and in my path of looking at these various cultures, I've pieced together various parts of technology and things that put into a different light start to bring on a, a different meaning. OK, so ancient technology, the extraterrestrial connection. What I'm going to do is basically go through several different artifacts and kind of jump around from a few different topics. Uh, ancient technology. Um, so we have artifacts that have been found around the world that in their own specific place where they've been located really are somewhat out of context. This one known as the Antikythera mechanism was found off the uh, coast of Antikythera um, and it's a very interesting device because it's dated back to around 200 BC and it's more complicated than a modern-day Swiss watch. It has up to 70 different cogs and wheels, all very intricately connected, and it served as two devices. It allowed for, it allowed for navigators to travel the sea and chart their position based upon various star constellations. It was also an astrological device in the sense that it could tell you, ah, oh, if you were born on June 25th, then your sun sign is this, and it means this. And so they attributed some esoteric knowledge to being able to know the positions of the stars based upon relation to your birth date. Now, another part of interesting technology that comes from a little bit earlier uh, back in history, uh, in the 2500 BC era, we find some wall reliefs in uh, ancient Egypt, which some people have claimed to be possible representations of light bulbs. I personally see that based upon the evidence from other cultures, it is very possible that the Egyptians were actually utilizing electricity 
Now, mainstream Egyptologists, of course, don't accept this, but there's this one era, area in Egypt called Dendera, and in this crypt, they have these reliefs that show these light bulbs um, that, again, under interpretation from what I see, it looks like it's connected to a power device. It's got a filament just like a light bulb would. And this, of course, raises the question as to if they had a light bulb, then, you know, what would they be using these things for? And, of course, more importantly, how would they power such a device? Now, most of the tombs and recesses and crypts in Egypt don't have any carbon or soot, any type of evidence of flame being used in abundance in some of these really dark areas. So that raises the question, how are they able to see and, and, and you know, carve these intricate hieroglyphs and drawings? Um, so an alternative theory is that they were using electricity, um, and to uh, illustrate this, Eric von Daniken had created a model of a light bulb that actually does function with a very low energy source. Uh, recently, I did an on-camera test for the Discovery Channel where I had uh, a clay pottery expert recreate the Baghdad battery, which is another artifact found in that same time frame of around 2500 BC, but it was located in Baghdad, in, in southern Iraq, uh, Babylon at the time. And a uh, very interesting artifact because they found about a dozen of these so far, now labeled as the Baghdad battery. And it's an interesting device because if you fill it with any type of weak acidic acid, grape juice, wine, vinegar, and put a voltmeter on the copper rod and the, uh, the iron and the copper, uh, then you get a positive charge of electricity. Um, so mainstream science says, well, you know, they weren't actually using this as a battery. It was just to electroplate jewelry. Uh, use, use it to create chemical processes that allow you to electroplate jewelry and such. But to me, I see a battery. And it makes sense that if we see light bulbs, that it's going to need a power source. And in that same time frame, we find a power source. So to me, it seems very logical that more than likely they were utilizing electricity in 2500 BC. Uh, here's an actual picture of that being tested on, on camera. Ancient engineering. Now, this is a part where uh, most recently on the Discovery, or excuse me, uh, most recently on the History Channel, uh, a show called Ancient Aliens uh, has been uh, divulging deeply into these topics of uh, very esoteric engineering from various cultures around the world, more specifically in South America where we have these types of blocks so finely fit together and an intricate design that modern day sculptors of stone look at this and say, <laughs> There's no way we could do this. You would need a diamond cut, a diamond tip saw, something very articulated to be able to penetrate granite and these very hard stones. Um, but yet these artifacts exist. And so this is something that even today we're looking at and trying to find the answers. And it seems to me very intriguing that a lot of these stones that are perfectly fit together or have these intricate designs uh, are, are displaying a type of heating of the rock that we can't figure out how they did it. The term is called vitrification. It just simply means that they've either had some type of device that we don't understand yet today that was a laser or some process to be able to heat these rocks to the point that they almost become molten. And then once they're molten, it makes it very easy to imprint or make very fine, intricate, detailed impressions or Lego-like blocks like we see in Egypt and how the Giza pyramids might have been built. So vitrification is a process of somehow the ancient people had a way of carving rock like it was wet clay and then just letting it harden into place. Now some of this stuff shows actual intricate detail of drilling. Again, you know, if this was molten and it was still wet uh, or, or, or almost a magma state and you could pierce through it and make these holes and then it hardened, that seems much more logical than using some advanced drill to somehow make these perfect holes. And, and really, there's another anomaly is the size of these megalithic stones. Some of these stones are called trilithotons, which means they weigh a minimum of uh, 1,000 tons. And so these are very large rocks that are being pulled from query sites, sometimes miles away, and then stacked perfectly to form these trilithoton-sized platforms that we see in Baalbek in Lebanon where the Wailing Wall is, and various other places that they've, you know, created these, these monuments to stack very large buildings. Uh, but no one knows today, 
you know, how they were able to quarry these stones. Even today, if we were to match with our own technology, large cranes and massive equipment to somehow quarry these rocks out and lift them, all right, well, one, we can't do the size that we see here. You can notice a gentleman standing on the tip of one of these stones. But more importantly, all of the ancient sites, as Giza is an example, where are the cranes? Where are the large megalithic size equipment that we would need to move these rocks? Any type of quarry site comparable to today's technology has large cranes, large equipment, yet we find none of that evidence from the ancient times. So they must have been utilizing some type of technology or something that we don't understand for one, how they made these perfectly fitting rocks, and two, how they move such large stones. Another thing that we see uh, on all continents is a pyramid connection. It's, uh, it's not just on one continent like in Giza. Pyramids are found all around the world. China, Europe, Africa, Mexico, Giza, uh, or you know, in, in Egypt. Um, there seems to be certain places on the earth that these monuments are built for a specific purpose. And usually it has something to do with worshiping their gods. But the architecture in the design is usually astronomically orientated. And if it was just one site, great. But we have several sites all around the world that were used to track the stars in a very accurate way that today we still wonder how the ancients were able to do this. Many of the cultures used a time system, which I'll touch on in a minute, that was a celestial time much larger than what we use today. We go around the sun once, and that's a solar year for us, 365 days. But it turns out the ancients used a cycle of precession tracked on a 26,000-year cycle of knowing how cyclic events happen, just like we're aware of, summer, winter, fall, spring, everything repeats. Well, so does a much larger cycle within our universe on a scale of time that the ancients seem to just know and incorporate it into their life, yet we don't, we're still trying to relearn this information. So a lot of these pyramids uh, have, uh, again, astronomical meanings, and uh, Eric von Daniken postulates that uh, here in Mexico, these various uh, pyramids are actually specific representations of planets in our solar system, and that there's actually nine pyramids laid out to represent the planets. Now that crosses over very interestingly enough into something I've studied heavily, which is the Sumerian culture and their knowledge of 12 members in our solar system, but very accurately knowing about the distance between our planets, the color of our planets, and we're talking 6,000 years ago they recorded this information, and now in modern science we confirm it with our knowledge sending probes to outer space. So it's very interesting to see these pyramids all around the world having some type of very esoteric uh, architecture built into them and usually astronomically aligned to certain constellations. Now some of these pyramids in Mexico are actually at the same scale in grandeur, at, at least at the base of the pyramid, as the one in Giza. So there are a lot of similarities of cross-oceanic similarities of architecture be built, yet mainstream science says no, they had no connection. They, they weren't traveling and seeing each other, yet the pyramid structures are found all around the world. It almost seems as if everyone has probably heard the idea of Atlantis. So it almost seems that if there was an advanced culture off the recorded history now, that they wouldn't have just been on one continent that somehow sunk into the ocean. They would have been a global civilization. Their technology would have spread around the whole globe. And so that's exactly what we see, is we see megalithic monuments all around the world from a time frame that's off recorded history. The civilizations that ensuing show up in these places take over these monu monuments, continue to build upon them, but the initial sites go back much further than what we have in recorded history. Uh, so Giza obviously is one of the pinnacle sites of recording information where the accuracy of how this was built is just dumbfounding. First of all, it's almost one-tenth off from true north. Even the Eiffel Tower isn't that accurately situated as far as how we are able to position its building in precision. Now, what's really interesting about the Giza Pyramid is its connection to the Orion constellation. Using star charting software, you can actually tell where the stars are going to be at certain positions in the sky. So tonight I can go out and I can use a little program on my PC like Redshift and see that, oh, look, 
the North Star is going to be right above my house. Great. Well, it turns out that you can also run this program back in time and go to the date of 10,500 BC, and we find the Orion constellation is exactly paralleled in the sky as a terrestrial map of the Giza pyramid. So the Giza pyramids actually are forming a representation of Orion on the ground. And what's also intriguing is at 10,500 BC, the Sphinx is gazing directly east into the constellation of Leo, which is the lion. So somehow, the Sphinx and pyramids are forming a terrestrial map of the sky at 10,500 BC. Now, <laughs> if the Egyptians built the pyramids in 2,500 BC, that would make it even more interesting as to how and why they would have created an alignment 8,000 years previous to their culture. That doesn't make sense. So more than likely, these pyramids are much, much more, uh, much older than we think. And people like Professor Schock uh, and others who have looked at the geological evidence and the weathering on these monuments around the Giza Plateau, like the Sphinx, clearly say that this is caused by massive amounts of water falling on these rocks. And the last time we had water in abundance in Giza, it's a desert, 10,000 years. So a lot of interesting things start to happen when we look at these monuments in a different light and don't just take the mainstream accepted view from someone like, you know, uh, respectfully, Zahi Huas, who works in the Giza Plateau and is the forefront of any antiquities discoveries that they might find. He has his own opinion and, and agenda, just as someone like NASA might. And it's an interesting thing for people to be independent in their approach to this information and come to their own conclusion. Because we have a lot of evidence. And, you know, there's uh, pyramids in, in Egypt where you can see that they were trying to build them, and it didn't quite go off the way they planned. And so they left a couple of sites unattended because it becomes bent. And they were like, well, this isn't, you know, acceptable. So uh, an overriding parallel is this idea of celestial time. Uh, the astronomical information by the ancient people is just, it's really overwhelming. What I've studied specifically is the fact that the Sumerian culture, the first civilization we have on Earth, comes out of ancient Iraq. Everyone's heard of Mesopotamia, Babylon. The first culture on recorded maps of civilizations that we've discovered today rest on the soldiers of the Sumerians, ancient Iraq. And they were the first ones to divide the heavens into 12 parts and actually create the zodiacal symbols of the divisional heavens breaking down into 12 parts. And what's interesting is that, you know, the whole idea of, you know, we're in the age of Aquarius, or we're in the age of Pisces, the ancients had a very simple way of determining what epoch they were in. You could go out at the time of helical rising, which just means that if you walk out early in the morning, right before the sun has crested over the horizon, you can still see, like, the moon and star constellations. So whatever constellation the sun is rising in front of, then they would say it's the age of Aquarius, the age of Pisces. And it was a very simple way to be able to track the movement of the heavens. They didn't have city lights in ancient times, so they watched the skylights very accurately. So this divisional heaven of zodiacal symbols, which is probably a little easier, um, is a very interesting thing that I've been studying now for 15 years with the Sumerian culture. But what I've started to realize and is becoming more clear to me is that many of these cultures had a much more advanced view than just a divisional breakdown to 12. 26,000 years looking out at a cycle taking place. Um, the Egyptians recorded on various hieroglyphs and wall reliefs this idea of a view of our universe, where it's not just showing the movements of our solar system or of a, a divisional breakdown of the heavens into 12 parts, it's a, a much more esoteric view and understanding of cycles taking place. So, it, you know, it, it's an intriguing anomaly that somehow all these ancient cultures based their calendar system, the Mayans, the Egyptians, the Sumerians, many of these ancient cultures had a knowledge of this 26,000 year of precession, where every 26,000 years the earth on its, you know, on its own rotational axis as it spins, it'll, it'll degrade its orbit it's wobbled by a degree or so every 26,000 years. Very slight change, but it does change the movement of how we see the position of the stars from our representation on Earth. And somehow the ancients knew this and tracked this cycle. Yet today we've lost this information. P 
people are interested in it now because you hear 2012 and they're like, ooh, the Mayans knew that the end of time in 2012. Well, this all ties into this. Somehow they had cyclical knowledge on a scale much more in longevity than we consider summer, spring, fall, winter. It's going to get cold again next year. It happens every year. They knew that things were going to happen in a cyclical basis. And it's a very intriguing way to look at how they based their time and how they did a lot of their uh, activities. Uh, here's just a little bit more of a detailed view of some of these artifacts. You can see the intricacy in the design that they went to to, to bring out the detail. So the Sumerian culture, again, this is a Sumerian artifact. This is uh, roughly uh, 4,000 years old, carved into a semi-precious stone. And you can see various uh, constellations uh, being represented by their animal or, or, or uh, zodiacal symbols here in this, in this element. Now, uh, another thing that we see across various cultures is the power of flight. And this one is really fun for the whole idea of the ancient astronaut theory because we can see this happening repetitively in various times in history. In more recent times, we have uh, World War II as an example. We fly to these remote areas that are populated by aboriginals and have never seen technology or, or white people. And all of a sudden, these US soldiers land in a prop plane, get out and light up a cigarette, hold up a voice recorder to the aboriginal and record their voice and play it back to them. They don't understand. They think these, these people are gods. They think the thing that they just landed in is a, li a living creature. And so they build straw models of the aircraft and they scrape away runways and they sit and worship these idols and hope that uh, you know, they'll return once they leave. Another thing is that sometimes you know, during wartime they drop cargo shipments into the, into the troops, camps, you know, supplies and refurb, refurbishments and such. And sometimes these shipments would not land in the troops and would land in the middle of the tribe. And they're like, oh, and they crack it open and it's got all these food and weapons. And they thought this is stuff from the gods, you know. So the whole idea of cargo cults is a term where ancient man looked at just us coming to visit them and, or, you know, and didn't understand, these aboriginals didn't understand technology. We can see the same thing playing out thousands of years ago where a lot of the artifacts and things and descriptions being told to us by the ancients is limited by their understanding of technology. So they're not going to show a spacecraft and say the technological craft was hovering in the sky. They're going to be like there was a chariot of fire. You know, they're, they're going to give it wings and say it had the power of flight. Now that doesn't mean it was an actual person flapping down or that it was a circle with wings in the sky. They're symbolically trying to represent that, and I'll show this point more in a minute. But these are various artifacts from the Sumerian culture, ancient Iraq, and you can always see this mystical thing in the backdrop of a winged disc. We see this also in other cultures like the Egyptians, sun god Ra. Um, but this originally uh, disseminated from Sumer and spread out to many other uh, Middle Eastern cultures. And it's a consistent way of them saying we were visited by our gods. Now, the gods that they discuss today, we would call extraterrestrials. Physical beings, technologically, also more spiritually advanced than us. They come and visit us, and they depart their wisdom. These are artifacts, again, from the Sumerian culture. This is Ishtar, or also Inanna. And you can look at the detail and complexity. Let's see if I have a front view of her. I don't. Um, the complexity and design and intricacy that they went in detail to sculpt these things thousands of years ago. She liked to roam the skies of earth as the tales go and she would choose various males to take into her sky abode but then they would never come back. She found one king uh, to be of interest, Gilgamesh, and was like, hey, come up to my sky abode. And he's like, thank you but no thanks. Seems like never, never, uh, no one ever seems to return. So these are stories recorded as myths and shown as artifacts, but is it really mythology or in their simple way are they trying to explain events that took place? Again, uh, a Sumerian god inscribed in a wall in Iran and Persopolis. Um, the intricacy of design, uh, you know, this pattern of a, a winged being. What are they trying to show us? Uh, Egyptian culture, we have the uh, Isis and various other uh, references like Ra that show this winged being. But we also see various artifacts that show representation of the power of flight. Now, this is a bird model to Egyptologists. They say it's a representation of a bird. But when you look at the aerodynamics of the wings 
everything here is proportional to an airplane, but not proportional to a bird in nature. And these artifacts, of course, are all around the world, not just in, 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 in Egypt, but across continents in South America, pre-Columbian plane models that were labeled as insects. These are insects. Giorgio Sukalos, who's speaking, uh, I believe, tomorrow, has a, a great little pin. I should have worn mine. Darn it, he gave me one as a gift. And, and it's a great little representation that it looks like a plane, yet they've labeled it as an insect. So you do have to wonder, it's not just one or two items, but several across cultures. This was found in Turkey, uh, recognized by Zachariah Sitchin in his book, Divine Encounters. Awesome book. And he had to convince the curator to say, look, I understand you don't think it's a rocket ship, you don't know what it is, but put it on display and let the, the public decide. And that's exactly what they did. Um, and they called it an unknown artifact. Sitchin calls it the headless spaceman. You can see very clearly rocket-like characteristics. A gentleman seated in some type of rocket-like engine. He's holding gears, he's wearing a, a suit, and there's even representations of an engine in the back. I mean, for an, for an ancient culture to just think of something like that, I don't think is possible. They had to have seen something, just like the cargo cult people, when the uh, soldiers come to the aboriginal tribes, tribes in prop planes, they make a model of a prop plane. They don't understand the prop plane, but they're fascinated by it. Same thing with the ancient people seeing beings visiting in craft. They might not have understood these craft, but they went to great lengths to depict them for us. Uh, this was just an interesting artifact I found in doing some research where it looks like someone's ascending or descending there, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, so ancient UFOs, again, you know, just going into a more advanced representation of the power of flight. Again, we see this all over the world um, and in very esoteric spots where, again, misrepresented as religious symbols or religious overtones can take on a different context. If we just step over that line in the dirt that say extraterrestrials don't exist, it becomes very clear. Here's a, a fresco in a Yugoslavian monastery you know, uh, 1500 B or 1500 years uh, ago, this thing was carved, and it's been upkept and, and, and restored o over and over. And you can see it's a crucifixion of Jesus, but in the background we have these very intricate craft being flown. You can see the people in the craft m like messing with some type of gear or maneuvering, um, and they're obviously in a representation of some type of flying craft you can actually see that in this painting, people are looking at these objects in awe. They're, hand, they're holding their hands up above uh, their face as if they're in fear. I think it'll pan to that here in a, just a second. Um, but everyone in, the, in, the, in this painting is well aware of these objects and is looking at them in awe and wondering you know, what they're doing there and what their purpose is and almost fearful of uh, what, the, what they could be. So we see a lot of these types of things throughout Renaissance artwork or religious artwork where the main focus might be on a, a, a symbol or a person like Jesus, but in the backdrop, we're getting information about that tale that, that is very, uh, very intriguing. Um, so, you know, to me, these aren't just mythological representations. They're doing their best with their limited understanding of technology to represent what they saw. So this one is a really great, you know, uh, the St. Giovanni picture of a uh, painting of Madonna, very well-known fresco. And it, it's just a very simple little thing to look over her shoulder and see that there's a, a gentleman with a dog looking at something in the sky. What is that? The artist went to very great detail to, to represent a luminous object that's catching the attention of people looking at it in the sky. And what could, what could that be other than, you know, I mean, it's not a falling rock, it's not a meteorite, it looks like some type of what we would call today UFO. And uh, these types of imagery come throughout Renaissance artwork, throughout history. These are described as glowing shields that were attacking them from the sky. So the Sumerian culture is really where I've focused a lot of my research uh, in understanding this culture's interaction with these beings they called Anunnaki. And the term in Sumerian, Anunnaki, just simply means those who from heaven come to earth. And what I found very interesting is that I was raised as a Christian. And so a lot of the things taught to me in the Bible, when reading the work of Zachariah Sitchin and other mainstream scholars, 
uh, that look into the Sumerian culture, I started to see a connection, just as mainstream science recognizes today, as these artifacts are on display, that the stories in the New Testament and the Old Testament have scientific fact, that there's actual stone tablet versions of these tales that still exist today. And when I studied these versions, rather than the New King James Version of the condensed tale told, the original tales tell a much more detailed explanation of man's interaction with the time when they lived amongst their living gods. And that happened to be taking place in one civilization called Sumer, known as Mesopotamia, Babylon, today's Iraq. 6,000 years ago it was called Sumer. Now, the most infamous scholar that has divulged into this research is Zachariah Sitchin. God rest his soul, Zachariah Sitchin has done uh, over 50 years, 5-0, 50 years of research into Semitic languages, and specifically ancient Iraq. Wrote a series of books called the Earth Chronicles, and uh, throughout my life I will continue to cite his research because it's the best to date of any ancient astronaut researcher I've seen. There are a lot out there, but Sitchin was the only one to go microscopic detail into one culture and really bring out the details. And we need other scholars, like John Major Jenkins, who's focused on the Mayans. We need other scholars to grab hold of a specific culture and dive, old, dive into it and get all these details out so that we can cross-compare the various cultures. So Sitchin has done a very good job of starting at the Sumerian culture and then seeing these other similarities uh, in, in, in other cultures. Now, specifically, again, Iraq uh, then was called Mesopotamia. Right between the Tigris, Tigris and Euphrates uh, rivers, we have this fertile strip of land. And from this culture, we have over 100 of the first needed for high civilization that we still attribute to the Sumerian culture. Most importantly is writing. They had the first system of writing. We think we're cool with our 26-letter alphabet. The Sumerian cuneiform script was 400 characters. And this is the first alphabet that we have recorded on Earth as a complete language of writing, 400 characters. Their system of writing was a stylus, looked like an oversized screwdriver, and they would twist it and turn it in the clay and make all these symbols in wet clay. And then they would stick that clay into a, a, a stove and heat it up into stone, literally keying that phrase, writing in stone. They sometimes recorded information on semi-precious stones. And what's really interesting about the Sumerian collection is that many of these artifacts are parallels to biblical tales. Um, as an example, the British Museum has thousands of these tablets not on display. Some of them are on display. One of them, is, as an example, is labeled the Flood Tablet. And it was discovered by the assistant curator to the British Museum in 1899 or just into the new century, 1900. Uh, his name was George Smith, and doing an excavation in a city of Ur, ancient Iraq, he found a tablet, and while he starts reading it, it's literally word for word the Noah's Ark tale. However, it's an Anunnaki, a Sumerian god, speaking to a Sumerian whose name is Utenpishim, and he's telling him, hey, you need to build a large craft, uh, a ship, it's going to be this length, the exact measurements, take all your family and animals in the area onto this craft, there's going to be a large flood. And... Uh, you know, the gentleman freaked out and ran, you know, saying, my God, look what I found. So he had found the actual flood tale in its original form, still written in stone. It existed. But it was a much more detailed story, a part of a much more long 11 tablets, um, actually 12 tablets, but the 12th was broken off. But um, th this, this tale was a much more intricate explanation of what we get in a condensed version of the New Testament. It tells you why we have a great flood and why the gods, gods, plural, chose not to save us. And it speaks of another planet that comes into our inner part of our solar system and causes gravitational effects. And at one point in, the, in our past, it cracked off part of our ice sheet, like an ice dropping into a glass of water, it instantly raised the water levels on Earth. So the Sumerians have very interesting information that when looked at through the religious tones, we have the basis of where these stories originated, the actual first versions. So scientifically, looking at that story, it does take on some interesting context. Now, so here's another tablet just showing some Sumerian writing. They went to great lengths to also record astronomical information. They tracked the heavens over hundreds of years. 
There were high priests that would take this information as sacred information and would follow it and, and pass it down to priests over time. Uh, a Sumerian priest that could read certain tablets could tell you 50 years in advance on one specific day there'd be a solar eclipse. So another part of their legacy is what we still use today is mathematics. Um, they had a base math of 60, and they actually used the, the number 6 and 10, sexagesimal math, 6 and 10 to do a very intricate division of small numbers and very large numbers. Um, they were the first ones to divide the, uh, the heavens into 12 parts, and they were the first ones to denote 360 degrees to a circle. Now, an interesting part about the Sumerian mathematics is tied to how they learned all this. They say, if you ask a Sumerian, how do you know all this stuff? How did you learn all this information? They say, well, everything we learned, we were taught by the Anunnaki, those who from heaven come to earth. And what's interesting about the Anunnaki is that they say they come from another planet within our solar system that's the 12th member of our solar system. And I'm going to touch on this more in a minute. It'll get clearer. But imagine that we have 12 members in our solar system, and this 12th planet is where the Anunnaki come from. They come to Earth, and they teach us all this advanced knowledge. Some very interesting similar similarities around the number 12, however. Their whole basis of what they've taught us revolves around them coming from the 12th planet. Well, we have 12 hours in a day, 12 inches in a foot, 12 in a dozen. 12 months in a year, the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples of Jesus, the 12 Greek Olympians. All of this symbology comes from the representation of the knowledge learned by the Sumerians from the Anunnaki, coming from the 12th planet. So it's really interesting some of these things and can be tracked through history as to the origins of where they come from. Um, this was an interesting artifact that actually shows uh, the symbol for Earth and its crescent moon. So you see seven dots in Earth uh, Earth's moon, and then you also see a symbol of a cross in its moon, which was to represent Nibiru. Now, the Sumerians represented the planet of where the Anunnaki came from as a large glowing cross in the sky. And this is 4,000 years before Jesus on the cross, and they're representing their home world of their gods as a glowing cross in the sky. So, obviously, uh, in more re you know, recent times, we look at these stories in the Bible of angels and wonder is there a, a ufology overtone that we're missing, you know, that they were actually not just traveling in chariots, but were being represented as, you know, beings that had the power of flight, but we didn't quite understand it at the time. And, uh, you know, there's some very interesting things and characteristics about the Anunnaki from the Sumerian culture. Everyone's seen a representation of an angel, and sometimes it has a halo over its head. The Anunnaki actually claimed they had a glow about them. There was, you know, information recorded by the Sumerians that if you saw an Anunnaki standing in front of you, you'd say, he's got kind of a glow about them. Now, their planet was a very luminous planet, very bright. Maybe it's the simple thing of you are a product of what you eat. We see here on Earth natural luminescence in insects and various animals in the ocean that can produce light naturally. So the whole idea of an aura and this halo of light from angels, again, is a misrepresentation of the Anunnaki having a literal light glow about them. Um, so that's just a very interesting parallel where, you know, again, me being raised as a Christian, it was always, they came down from heaven. It's never, all cultures say that they were visited by their gods, and they never say that their gods came from the mountains or from across the lake. They always came from the skies. So these are very interesting representations coming from the Sumerian culture of these Anunnaki, and uh, there is some humor here, too, of, you know, what we can see from today's uh, representations of culture, that here it is, uh, a Sumerian king on a platform, uh, and you can see that an Anunnaki is coming to meet him for some symbolic meeting. But below that, you can see this platform is being held up by all the people from the, the civilization. I, I would claim these to probably be taxpayers that are holding this up to make this happen. <laughs> which isn't too far from the truth from today. Um, so, you know, a lot of these representations of winged beings and the power of flight, to me, is a representation of their limited understanding of technology and just trying to say, we had people just like us flying and visiting us, and they were coming from the heavens. Another uh, just kind of a pulled-out shot of, this, uh, of these wall reliefs in Iran and Persopolis, and you can see the detail that they go to 
in showing these and always, you know, symbolically is that winged disc uh, ho hovering, hovering overhead. So the symbolic reference of these Anunnaki is intriguing because I don't think that they were actually winged beings flapping down from the skies. The angels in the Bible were not flapping down. They were symbolically showing they had the power of flight. Now what we do see here is another interest is you can see he's holding the water of life and the, and the tree of life symbolically. But around his wrist looks like a nice watch. You know, I don't know if that's just coincidence, but the detail of what they would probably be using if they had technology might be that the Anunnaki had devices on them and the Sumerians not understanding at least went to the detail of representing that here. But what is interesting is that when we look at the same modern symbology of what we use today, for instance, for the first landing on the moon, I seriously doubt that we were landing birds on the moon, meaning 6,000 years from now, they're not going to look at the Apollo 11 and say, were they, were they landing birds on the moon? No. We were symbolically saying that we had the power of flight. And so everyone's famous with that saying, you know, Houston, the eagle has landed. So we were using symbolic representation, just as the ancients did, to say they had the power of flight. Okay, so this kind of touches into the, some of the Sumerian information for a, a question of great, great interest that a lot of people do take for fact, that there was a great flood. And, uh, you know, we have evidence around the world of pieces of, uh, you know, artifacts, these maps as an example, uh, the Perry Reese map and the Charles Hapgood map, which I'll flip to in a minute. I can't read the text from here, unfortunately, but you can get a glimpse at that for a moment. Very interesting maps that show detail of our coastlines, global coastlines, at a time when they were all covered by at least a mile thick of ice at the polar uh, caps, like today. Yet the topography is accurately mapped out in maps that are on gazelle hides from like, you know, uh, 1500. You know, so the, the, the dates on some of this uh, uh, creation of these maps is, is really an anomaly. And they accurately show the coastline and the animals and, and, and the type of, uh, you know, things that you find on these different continents uh, to the point where scholars look at this and say, well, you know, how would they have had the ability to be at that such a high point in space above the earth to accurately write out this topography? And it's not just one map, but several that accurately show topography of Antarctica, the South and North Pole. And this is under a mile thick of ice. You need ground penetrating radar to be able to, to, to see the actual landmass rather than the snow or the ice. So someone had to tell the ancient people, someone told them this initially and it was obviously carried as sacred information by navigators. Um, the flood tablet, the one I had mentioned earlier, here it is. This is uh, on display in the British Museum. Um, it's a physical artifact that does exist. And uh, again, it's a very interesting look into our past to validate mythological or religious information that under a new context starts to take on reality, real artifacts, real locations, and possible real beings that did visit us. Uh, visit us. Um, giants upon the earth, you know, again, representations by the Sumerians much more accurate of showing beings that are larger than us and having them being renowned, um, giving them prominence. Uh, so this is a Sumerian king uh, being visited by Sumerians, but again, you look at the representation of giants upon the earth, uh, it's an interesting, consistent thing that we do see from ancient peoples um, holding their gods or these kings that, that, that visited them, in, you know, in high respect. So an, a really interesting part of the Sumerian information that crosses over into modern science is the fact that they clearly state that the Anunnaki come from another planet in our solar system. They, they describe the planets in our solar system the distance between these planets accurately. Science has to accept, and they do to a certain degree, that this information is very intriguing. But what does it lead for our future? This is where the speculation begins. Now, here's a very intriguing artifact from the Sumerian uh, epic um, that is symbolically the Anunnaki is granting a Sumerian the plow, so it's modern agriculture, but as a backdrop in the lower corner, we see what is a representation of what we currently have now, like a rocket on a launch pad with its stabilizer. Um, many representations of rocket ships shown in Sumerian artifacts. But what's really intriguing 
is in the upper part of this, we see a complete representation of our solar system accurately. And this is thousands of years old, yet the sun is in the center. There's no way they could have known that. I mean, Copernicus and Galileo, with the assistance of mathematics and advancements in the telescope, allowed them to go, we're orbiting the sun. Wow, cool. But the Sumerians knew this thousands of years ago and not only showed it accurately with the sun in the center, but also put all the planets that we know of in their correct size and position. So this is some pretty interesting information. The Sumerians say that we're on the seventh planet, the sacred number seven, seven days in a week. The Sumerians say that the Anunnaki coming from outside our solar system in, they passed by six planets before coming to Earth, the seventh planet. So it's not the third rock from the sun as the hip TV show called it, actually represented as the seventh planet. Um, the Sumerians uh, had a representation of 12 members in our solar system uh, where they counted the nine planets that we know of, the sun, our moon, 11, and then Nibiru as the 12th planet. Nibiru is the planet that they called the home world of the Anunnaki. And Nibiru, interestingly enough, simply means the planet of the crossing. Uh, here's just a, a graphic representation, not to scale, showing the Sumerian version of our solar system with a representation of 12, uh, a knowledge of 12 members in our solar system. So very interesting uh, stories that come out of some of these texts, uh, like the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Atrehasis, some of these stone tablets that tell a much more longer version about how we got here and how our solar system was created. They explain a story that when our solar system was just forming, which we roughly say 4.7 billion years ago, when the planets had just finished coalescing into hard mass, the Sumerians explain that when the planets had not yet become solid, an, an intruder planet gets sucked into the inner part of our solar system. It becomes gravitationally affected by the outer planets and gets pulled into the inner part of our solar system. And on one of the passes, the moons of this intruder planet whacked our primitive Earth, which we then called Tiamat, or not us, but the Anunnaki. They called this planet Tiamat, and it, it struck our Earth so hard that it literally cracked our Earth, Tiamat, into half, strewing out the asteroid belt and moving Earth into the position that it now is in. And now that simple explanation from the Sumerians explains an anomaly in modern cosmology that they still don't have an answer for. How was the asteroid belt formed? Why are some of the planets tilted on their side like Uranus? Are, are Pluto and Neptune possibly dislodged moons of Saturn? This one intruder planet is today being analyzed by top space conglomerates very advanced computer models that say one rogue planet brought into our solar system explains all these anomalies. And so they're trying different factors very similar to the Sumerian one, but it's already told right here, and it's like so simple. So after this collision, Earth goes into its or orbit that it is now in and is basically just a chunk of land, but now all planets siphon into a sphere, a round ball. So Another interesting thing is now explained. If Earth is just half a planet after that collision, all the water siphons into a sphere, we would have had one land mass. And that's exactly what we'd had, Pangaea. Pangaea, like the skin of the apple, has come loose and the continents have drifted to where they are. But everyone accepts as a standard fact, at one time Earth was one land mass. If that was the case, it's supporting the idea that there was an ancient collision that made it into half a planet. So this is a very interesting thing that we can confirm now to see that all the continents, like a jigsaw puzzle, come and they fit together. And everyone pretty much accepts that as a, as a modern day norm today. But why and how explained by the Sumerians 6,000 years ago? And there's our wonderful half planet Earth. <laughs> um, so another part of this tale is very intriguing though. This, this planet uh, goes on to have a very elliptical orbit but stays a part of our solar system. So after this initial collision, it has an orbit that is now 3,600 years. One loop around the sun for this planet is 3,600 of our years. A solar year for us, one time around the sun is 365 days. This planet, it takes 3,600 years to loop around. 
So this brings up a whole bunch of questions. Well, how does it go far out into space and still loop back? If there's beings living on this planet, the Anunnaki, how do they go far out in space and retain heat? These all, there's answers for all of this. Our modern science recognizes that most solar systems externally that we've been imaging are binary, two suns. The Hubble has been imaging all types of external solar systems, and most of them have two suns. That stands to reason we have two suns. But our sun, our second sun, is a brown dwarf, a failed sun. It's burnt out. And our science has detected a large asteroid belt billions of miles beyond Pluto where there's possibly another planet our, or, or, or sun, our, our, you know, a failed brown dwarf that um, has its own asteroid belt and they've theorized over the years uh, debris gets dislodged from this failed sun and comes into the inner part of our solar system and that's why we see large impact craters all over the planets and such. So the scientists are, are analyzing this and are, are very intrigued by the idea of another planet being inter injected into our solar system model. And recently NASA has been looking for another planet beyond Pluto, which co coincidentally has very strong ties to the Sumerian understandings of another large body in our solar system. Nibiru is four to eight times the size of Earth. It's a large planet. It's not something we're going to miss. It's not a little snowball drifting out there beyond Pluto. And that's exactly what NASA has been identifying, is planetoids, objects that are below 1,000 kilometers in diameter, but are new planetoids being discovered. This raises the question, what else are we going to discover? So they understand that there's a model in place that can show that planets can have elliptical orbits and are not easily recognized because space is a three-dimensional plane. It's not easy to always identify a planet's orbit uh, by just looking at a star chart. You might see a planet, but where it's going or where its you know, orbit is uh, situated, it's not easy to locate. So this is a very interesting uh, collaboration between Zacharias Sitchin, who did 50 years of research into the Sumerian culture and their understandings of the Anunnaki coming from Nibiru, and he's meeting with Dr. Harrington, who at the time was the lead astronomer for the Naval Observatory in Washington. Sitchin is showing the planetary model for Nibiru having an elliptical orbit. Harrington is showing his model for a tenth planet also having an elliptical orbit. You can see that the plane is going up rather than to the side on a two-dimensional piece of paper, but same idea. It's a planet on an elliptical orbit. And they were comparing models where Sitchin's like, well, the Anunnaki told the Sumerians this, and Harrington's like, well, we're learning this, and it's an interesting overlap. Um, where science does accept the idea that there's possibly another large planet that we're trying, we're trying to find. Back in the 90s, Harrington had detected what are called perturbations on the outer planets, simply meaning all the planets are being pulled in a certain direction that led them to believe there's some other large mass causing this gravitational effect, but they can't find it. They're not looking for that gravitational effect anymore. Now we use much more advanced telescopes, uh, looking for heat signatures for extrasolar planets. Um, but it's very possible that if Nibiru does exist, and at any point in time it's coming back towards Earth, we will see it. Now, what is interesting is that NASA has been releasing a slew of articles in the media for the idea that, hey, there's a large planet out there and we're going to find it. Um, so, you know, it would be very interesting to have confirmation within our lifetime uh, of, of Nibiru. Some of the telescopes that are out there, this is Sirtif, this one's excellent. Um, the quality and the detail that this telescope is able to achieve, it's, it's a super cool telescope sitting out in space. Problems with Hubble and various other telescopes are that when they pierce deep into space, there are these dust clouds or layers of debris that they can't see through. So using infrared heat, they can tune these telescopes down to the exact temperature of a dust field and then through infrared penetrate right through it. So they can now see into various parts of space with detail that they've never been able to see before. You can see the original shot under true light up in the corner, but under Sirtif's infrared, <laughs> look at the detail. All those little dots are suns. Um, so we're, I mean, we're looking at the detail of, of what we're able to get now with our technology and, and discovering new worlds and new solar systems. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really incredible. What's also incredible is that the space agencies continually seem to be 
confirming the ancient knowledge. This is a recent planetary model called Orpheus, explaining how they created the moon. <laughs> a large planet enters our solar system and impacts Earth, and the debris coalesce to form our moon. Hmm, that sounds very similar to a planetary model described by the Sumerians 6,000 years ago, which we just discussed. But this is modern science now trying to explain how the moon was possibly formed. Um, so one point of interest to people who are familiar with the topic of Planet X or Nibiru is the return of Planet X and when this might take place. People speculate it's going to happen within our lifetime perhaps or in 2012. Well, let's look at the math. We know that in the creation of the solar system 4.7 billion years ago, 4.6 roughly, uh, is when Nibiru initially became a part of our solar system. We know Nibiru has a 3,600 year orbit. So if we divide, I can't, 4.7, forgive me, I can't see from here, 4.6, 4.7 by 3,600 years, we get over a million times Nibiru has completed its orbit around our sun. Not always or every time it's going to cause effects here on Earth. We could be uh, completely on the different side of the sun than Nibiru while it's passing the inner part of our solar system. So it might not always have gravitational effects. And what is also interesting to note is that between Mars, Jupiter, where the asteroid belt is, there's actually enough room for another planet to freely pass through there. Uh, so another uh, interesting part of the Sumerian legacy that ties into modern ufology is a crossover of what we see today is the greys or these beings associated around modern abductions. Well, we have similar beings being reported by the Anunnaki as helpers of the Anunnaki. Excuse me, the Sumerians reporting these beings as helpers of the Anunnaki. And there were instructions to interact with these beings to tell whether it was alive or it acted as if it were alive. So these are very interesting similarities to what we see as the modern day gray aliens. And I would just interject that a lot of the times these beings are performing medical checkups um, I don't have a shot of that one. They're performing medical checkups or, or doing some type of, you know, extraction of fluids. It seems very possible that we were genetically created by more advanced beings, these Anunnaki, and they created us in their image and after their likeness. They might also have genetically manipulated other races, maybe these, and have them constantly keeping tabs on their project, these human beings, and having these creatures help and relaying and getting information about us. You know, uh, the helpers or the watchers is sometimes referred to throughout history. There are many representations of these bulbous-eyed, large-head beings throughout history being involved uh, with humanity. Um, so we just have to wonder the correlation from, you know, our modern representations of aliens and abductions. Uh, there has to be some similarity. Where I first started my research, and I'll kind of touch on the last few points as I wrap this up, I was originally intrigued by the structures on Mars. I had no interest in UFOs or aliens, but someone had mentioned to me while I was attending college that NASA had taken photos of a face, a humanoid face carved out of rock and pyramids on Mars. And I was like, what? Come on. So looking into this research, uh, I started to become very intrigued by all the space agencies and things that were happening. And it turns out while going to school in San Diego, uh, California, one of the principal contractors that attaches their cameras to all the orbiters we've been sending over the last 20 years, his name is Mike Malin, Dr. Mike Malin of Malin Space Science Systems located in La Jolla, California. So as a college student, I had contacted Dr. Mike Malin and said, is there any possibility that the face and pyramids are artificial structures? He said, no, of course not. These are all natural sand weather eroded objects, nothing artificial to see here. So I started to take a closer look at NASA and I've seen over the years that their technology is advancing. The amount of information that we're now getting from the telemetry of our satellites around the pictures, the, the detail, it's becoming much, much more detailed. I'm gonna go through a couple examples so that you understand, but then we have to, to wonder why they don't use this technology over the really cool areas like the face and pyramids. So here you can see a small area that when blown up, they can actually track over time small geological changes and say, wow, look, we are seeing changes happening, weathering taking place, boulders moving around, wind. Um, so they track very accurate. You can see that the pixel detail 
down to the pixel in complexity is much more complex, the amount of data that we can pull out now. And we're going to be sending a whole bunch of new missions over the next 10 years that are slated. Now, a lot of this stuff is not going to answer, is there life on Mars? There's some engineer at NASA that's been spending 10 years of his life to build some little arm that's going to go into the dirt and it's going to look for minerals. Great. And those minerals might show signs of life. They are not detecting or making any arm device or some trap that's going to like scoop up a bug on Mars. That stuff might be there now, but the political track for us to get there, we have to develop the technology to actually find these things. And so what's really interesting is that there is something happening with uh, Mars and a, and a slowing down of what we're learning. NASA is not the only space agency giving us this data now. And we're starting to see an inconsistency from NASA looking at their history and track record of information. There's no water on the surface of Mars, yet in 1976, we see snow on the surface. Here it is. These are images I took from NASA archives that actually show snow on the surface of Mars from the Viking orbiter. What's even more intriguing is the color differentiation in the sky. What happens is that the, the, the orbiters, when we stand there, are taking a much more higher spectrum of color than what the human eye sees. When you correct these images that we're taking from Mars, RGB spectrum of what the eye sees, that's what Mars looks like. It looks just like Earth. It's got blue skies. But somehow, we don't ever get those pictures color corrected for us. They just assume that we're going to know that we need to color correct it. So some of the other areas are possible actual vegetation. This, to me, just looks like some grayish oily streaks. I don't know what that is. But under a different light, it looks much more interesting. This one's taken by NASA. This one's taken by ESA, the European Space Agency. Same coordinates, true color. That, to me, looks like vegetation. We have had an abundance of methane gas detected in the atmosphere of Mars, plant material uh, being uh, you know, decomposed. So NASA has been letting out little pieces of stuff. Salt water found on Mars. Weird artifacts up there. But they've never been forthcoming about these original ones, the face and pyramids. This came down in the 70s, and they labeled it head. It came down live over the camera, and they said, oh, it's the head. That's oh, so cool. We imaged it a few hours later, and it was gone. Wrong answer. On several different orbits, the, the satellites are in different positions. The shadows are different. The angles are different. You still see a face. Um, I did an interesting test that, uh, I'm surprised no one actually has pointed this out. It looks like all the monuments at Cydonia, this region where the face and pyramids are, it's called Cydonia, is built right on the edge of water. Everyone on Earth lives near waterfront property, or likes to, near a lake, near a river, near the ocean. We can see a very clear terrain change. The bright, knobby terrain becomes dark and more mellow. Look at how it's situated. We see the, the pyramids and all the objects that are pyr pyramidal form on the land. Going out into the water where it becomes more mellow and dark is the face. It's almost like it's a monument situated just like we do here on Earth. Like the Washington Monument or the Statue of Liberty, surrounded by water, something for us to look at. And it seems that's exactly how it was built on Mars. I'll just flip one slide back here. Uh, all the land masses right on the edge of that terrain change into a more mellow, darker terrain. Face out there as a monument. Um, and the face has really had a hard time getting publicity. This is uh, the face in 1998, a more recent image because it goes back all the way to the 70s. It doesn't look that great. And for some reason, it's gotten worse as NASA's technology has gotten better. How is that possible? Look at the progression of clarity starting from the 70s up till now. What happened? Okay, that's cool. That's fine, NASA. Here is a strip taken from a certain part of Mars on, on the same camera, and you can see the quality and the complexity and detail. When they get over the face, the original picture was that dark gray strip. And you had to use, in Photoshop, some, some you know, light enhancement to actually see what was there. Out of a 256 shade gray uh, image, 256 shades of gray, they only displayed 64 shades of gray for the face. It's like they went to as lowest resolution as possible and said, oh yeah, here's Sidonia. That's OK, because even with that really bad image, look at the data that still comes out. And there's no science being done here. Everyone's face is asymmetrical. If I look in a mirror and I move my arms and legs, it looks like I'm doing it from both sides. The same thing happens here with the face. If we take that 
even the worst version of it and slice it down the middle and mirror both sides, watch what happens. If you look at the right side, you can see that there's eyes, nose, face. It still looks like a face. From the side that's really badly eroded, there's still facial characteristics. But the left side, the less eroded side, <laughs> you can't hide that. That can't just happen by natural coincidences. We see a headdress. We see an ornament that's almost Egyptian in a sense. Eyes, mouth, nose, everything symbolically representation of a lion and a human. Just like we see in, in, in Egypt with the Sphinx and uh, you know, the pyramids, this, this connection. There has to be some type of Mars-Earth connection. Um, so many of these artifacts on Mars show some type of detail or, or, or artifacts that uh, really do merit more study. And I don't know that we'll ever get the true answers to, these, uh, uh, to this information by sending probes and orbiters. Again, you can see the contrast difference taken in 1976, then under higher resolution, these objects are still pyramidal in form and very possibly artificial. Again, just showing the contrast from two different dates, you know, a couple different decades and change. A little more clarity, still looks like a pyramid. So I'm hoping that within our lifetime we're going to send people to Mars. And if we do, we're probably going to find some interesting parts of our history that uh, show that, you know, we aren't just a, an Earth-based civilization. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up my lecture for today. Thank you very much. Uh, am I allowed to take a few minutes for questions? I'll take that as a yes. Yes, sir, you right there. I don't know the answer to that other than I know that the Earth already did have oceans naturally here and that the waters of Nibiru co-mingled with Earth and so some of the things science today calls direct panspermia or panspermia is a, a, a great entryway in explaining how prekaryotes and uh, small living organisms show up whole and complete here on Earth and our oceans yet they don't know how. There's not enough time in 4.7 years for evolution to have produced you know, uh, small organisms that can take in and expel waste, yet we have those. And so one theory is, is that Nibiru and colliding with Earth intermingled their more advanced waters with us, giving us life instantly as a panspermia event. But how our Earth oceans originally got here, I'm not sure. Next question. Yes, sir, in the colorful shirt there. Mm. Yeah, so there, there's been, um, the, the question is, is, is there, have, have there been any new advances uh, in ways to detect planets far out in space? And have we been able to detect, for instance, our own brown dwarf? Um, they have been detecting various different sized planets out there, but not specifically one attached to our solar system. Uh, they do recognize various planetary bodies, but then, again, interpreting that on a 2D image and saying, here's a new planet, and determining its orbit is a very complex process. Yes, in the far we, back. There. We have a microphone, so let's use the mic. What about that space that you said, like, this could be called Vista, the one that comes from the I think it's, I think it's really interesting. The question is that there have been, you know, uh, many different extrasolar planets being discovered recently that have Earth-like characteristics and they continue to hone this search for these type of planets. Um, I, I, on a personal level, I feel that we have technology in place that already allows us to do much more deep space observations that, than what's publicly being told. But the public information that is starting to come out around some of these telescopes is intriguing that they are refining their math and capabilities of being able to see a little tiny dot around a sun a trillion miles away and, and, and tell by the blip that it's an Earth-like planet because it has water and it's situated from its sun at such a distance as is Earth to make the temperatures just right. Yes, sir. One time some professor, someone had a TV special that said that 
most of our civilization's artifacts, if they were abandoned, wouldn't last more than 100,000 years. So uh, that's one of the reasons why it's hard to find uh, ancient artifacts. Hmm. Well, I know researchers like Michael Cremo and, 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 and others have touched on the idea that, again, civilizations go much further back than recorded history. So, uh, you know, I think it's very possible that in, in time we will discover pieces of uh, artifacts and things from other cultures that show our, our track record goes much further beyond the dates than we currently accept now. I saw a question somewhere over here. Yes? Go ahead. Yes. Oh, you want the mic, though. Just toss it over to him. Uh, do you know uh, European Space Agency is uh, releasing a face on the Mars images? Uh, I think the question is, are they releasing images of the face on Mars? And I do not know the answer to that. I have not stayed up with ESA recently. Um, I would assume more than likely they do have plates that encompass the Cydonia region. How zoomed in those plates are uh, would probably be a good thing to look into. Uh, anyone else? Yes, sir. So why are the Anunnakis here? Uh, why are the Anunnaki here? Yeah. Why are they doing here? Why aren't they here or why are they here? Why are they here and what are they doing here? Okay. Uh, well, the, the Anunnaki explained to the Sumerians that they originally came here to seek gold and fine precious elements to repair their planet Nibiru's dwindling atmosphere. The Anunnaki explained that their rise to their own technological civilization messed up their atmosphere, similar to what we're doing here on Earth. And they found out that by using fine particulates of gold sprayed up into the Nibiru's atmosphere helped patch and insulate the heat. We know that gold is used in the astronauts' visors. It's a great insulator of heat, um, reflector of heat. And uh, so the Sumerians have recorded that the Anunnaki originally came here to mine gold in the veins they found in southern Africa and had a very hard time mining that gold. And so they decided to create a worker race out of, in their image and after their likeness, but out of the Neanderthal man that was here naturally and that's where we come into the picture, doing all their mining of gold and such. Anyone else? Take a couple more questions. Yes, ma'am. Is there a complete uh, English translation of flood tablets? Uh, is there a complete uh, English translation of the flood, Sumerian flood tablets? I, I believe there is. There's, there's a couple of authors, um, M. E. L. Malowin, and um, oh, the other one's slipping my mind at the moment. Uh, but there are a few authors that have translated a, a bulk of the Sumerian tablets, and I would, I would venture to guess that that one has also been translated into English. The only problem is, is that mainstream linguists interpret some of the Sumerian items differently versus people like Zachariah Sitchin. One of the tablets shows uh, the seven dots and a crescent moon and some people under it, and a mainstream linguist from the British Museum says, oh, that's the seven sisters of Pleiades the Pleiades constellation. And Sitchin says, dude, it's the seven dots of Earth. They're representing Earth, the seven dots, the seventh planet. So there are similarity differences between mainstream interpretations. Um, but you can still pretty much garner the information if it's translated into English. Uh, certain, certain items might have some discrepancies. Another question. Yes. You referred to those angelic beings, that they are, um, their light is coming from the Anunnaki. So does it mean if one practices meditation to become enlightened, they, we would uh, transfer into Anunnakis? Um, I, I can't answer that, but I'll give you a different answer, which is the Anunnaki, the, uh, so, hmm. Human beings are the only species on the planet that have a genetic partition on their brain. We only use 3 to 10% of our brain. Every other species, insect, animal, uses their whole neural network. So in that reasoning, it seems that the Anunnaki, in creating us in, in their image and after their likeness, dumbed us down and did not give us the full potential of what we have if we're only using 10% of our brain for some reason. So to answer that, I would hope that within our lifetime, I think it would be really cool if they could crack this genetic lock 
or you swallow a pill or something and all of a sudden you're, you know, using your full brain and you're like, hmm, and the thing lifts, you know. Um, that's uh, something, you know, uh, we can't confirm at this point other than there are idiot savant and other areas that we see these geniuses do appear. The human mind has the ability to expand. Um, so hopefully there is a way for us to become more Anunnaki. Okay, thank you. Sure. Next question. Uh, CERN, what do they do in CERN? This is a research in Austria, and they are looking for the God particle. I'm, I'm not sure I follow that one so, so much. Yeah. CERN? What? Yeah, the accelerator. I see. So, in your opinion, what, they are, what are they doing there? I, I, I have not followed that research enough to, to give you an opinion. I know there's a gentleman named Matthew Alper on a more of a skeptical side who's, dis, who's discovered the God part of the brain that when stimulated produces this effect very similar to having a near-death experience. So scientifically, they're at least going, hmm, there's something happening when we stimulate the brain. But crossing that over into actually utilizing that, um, I, I haven't really studied that information. Any other questions? A couple more. Yes, sir. Uh, with uh, regards to the, uh, the flood tablet, what was, what was the reaction among historians or the world community at the time? And oh, they were amazed. It was, it was a very well-renowned event to accept the fact that recorded history in biblical form does have actual fact basis. Um, a lot of the locations, like the city of Ur, U-R, uh, were talked about mythologically and then actually found. So we start to bridge that, sc that gap between modern science and ancient knowledge. One more question. Yes, sir. So the question is, uh, what, uh, what do I think of the show Ancient Aliens? Uh, and uh, what are some of the ramifications to their looting of the artifacts in Iraq? The Ancient Aliens special, I think, is uh, now in season two. And I think it's very rare that a special on an esoteric channel like the History Channel would cover ancient astronaut theory in a positive light, doing five two-hour specials, and now doing 10 one-hour specials. Um, I'm very grateful to be a part of that, and, I, and I'm, I extol the crew for doing it in a very uh, academic light, and not just putting it as a, like a hoopla, it's all, you know, uh, nothing real to see here. There is real evidence, and they're doing it the right way. The looting in Iraq was a very interesting event. Um, I think there was many ties to why we went into Saddam and, and got him out of there. Some of the rumors off the mainstream charts were that he had access to extraterrestrial technology. They had a Roswell type event and they were reverse engineering technology that they didn't want the UN or, or Saddam to be able to come into light and so we came in there and said Whew. Um, A lot of the artifacts that were missing were talking about intricate pieces of human history that were not just like someone broke a window while the war was going on and reached in and grabbed something. These were under lock and key guarded safes and people with walkie-talkies and ear devices came in had coordinated explosions and things take place to loot some of these precious artifacts. Um, so, you know, I, I'm sure that there are still a lot of these missing and it's really a bummer because we're talking about information that holds maybe secrets to unlocking various things that will allow us to access the full part of our brain or um, you know uh, just a, an, an appreciation for our history that now is lost because these artifacts have been looted all right thank you very much folks enjoy the expo